Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome. So, a uh, small group, and, and I don't know what you guys expect. You don't know what I have to say, so we can make this a little bit flexible over the next 45 minutes or so. So, as you heard, I'm Adam Fleming. I'm a person who looks after kids with brain tumors almost exclusively as part of my job, and I'm lucky to do so. How many people in this room are patients or former patients? How many people in this room are family members of, of have loved ones and affected by brain cancer, brain tumors? And any healthcare professionals who work in this field looking, caring for these patients? So please make sure you ask any questions along the way. We can make this a bit dynamic. I've got a whole bunch of slides, but, uh, but I really kind of want to kind of look under the hood of what a neuro-oncologist thinks about things and see um, if you have any questions going from there. And as brain tumor survivors, the young people that I treat become more and more uh, present in our society because cure rates are going up, we're diagnosing more, diagnosing more kids and doing a bit better that way. Uh, I'd like the message to be getting out there that people have been through a lot in their lives and here are some of the things that can impact them. Um, instead of including pictures of my actual patients, the nice thing about Google is I can find pictures that uh, look very similar to all of them. So um, I have stolen some of those uh, on loan from, from Google Images uh, as we go through. And uh, the objectives here are really broad, just a who, what, where, when, why, and how for pediatric brain tumors, what happens to them during and, and after the diagnosis. Uh, because I knew we were going to be live streaming, um, I don't do a lot of fancy stuff with tech, but this program worked really well at the last conference I was at. Does anybody have a cellular telephone or smartphone? If you do and, and you don't feel like you're the kind of person who wants to put up their hand and ask questions, all you have to do is on your laptop or, or smartphone, go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O, and literally it'll just come up, enter the code BTNC, you just have to put that in. And then you can type in anything you want and it'll show up on my computer right here. So I think for, if there's anybody listening on live streaming, um, if you want to pop up with a question, I will keep my eye on the computer here. And if there's anything that you're hesitant or embarrassed to ask or just want to put out there for discussion at the end, please do that. So BTNC for slido.com. Um, as you heard, I'm, I've, I've, I've been around. I, it's a long training road. You become a pediatrician first. Uh, you don't have to become an engineer. I did, uh, McMaster, um, and went through pediatric hematology and oncology are always the way we train in pediatrics. We look after all kids with leukemia, brain tumors, solid tumors, and the like. There is no such thing in, in, uh, in, in the adult world in exactly the same fashion. But um, I wanted to train specifically in neuro-oncology, went for further training, and started my career at McGill and came full circle 20 years later back to McMaster for a very fulfilling job at McMaster Children's Hospital, which is one of the five major pediatric centers in this province. Um, very lucky to be back. It's my clinical job. I do a lot of other research and academic jobs. But my clinical job is really to have all of the expertise on the prognosis and treatment options for anything that I see coming through the door. Any child with a brain tumor or potential brain tumor is going to be getting, hopefully, the kind of world's opinion, not just my opinion, but the world's opinion, because we all talk to each other in my field uh, about what this is, what, what's going to happen, what are, the, what are our hopes, what are our dreams, what are the bad things that could happen as well, and then to make a plan. And really, for me, I always tell parents, we're trying to get as much treatment as we have to to get the job done to cure your child and as little as we can get away with. That's very important because a lot of the things that we do can be increased or decreased, but we're always trying to find the sweet spot of, of cure with the, the little cost as possible. And of course, along the way, we want to engage families in high quality research because we do not cure every single type of tumor. And until that point, everything we do is going to have to have the flavor of research. How can we make this better? When is it going to get better? And how are we going to engage patients to help us in that journey like we've been doing for decades? 
So we know, as you've maybe heard this morning, lifetime risk of any brain tumor sits somewhere in one in 150. That's not childhood brain tumors, but that's just us, all of us getting a brain tumor in our lives. Um, the, the word brain tumor is very, is, uh, very vague in and of itself, as you've heard. The second most common group of cancers in childhood are the CNS um, lesions, uh, the spinal and brain tumors. So it's the second, next to leukemia, it's the second most common thing we treat. And the leading cause of solid tumor death in children uh, um, it, it causes more, we lose more of those battles than any other solid tumor that we have, bone tumors, muscle tumors, kidney tumors, and such. And at McMaster Children's uh, medium-sized center, we only see about 25 or 30 new cases a year. Sick kids would be over 100, and other centers would kind of fall in, the, in somewhere in that range. Now, who gets brain tumors at, at the age of patients I see are everything from birth. I've had babies that have been born with a, with a brain tumor that was picked up on, on uh, antenatal ultrasound or MRI, um, all the way up to patients that are 18. And beyond that, we get into the situation where we pretty much have to transfer to an adult colleague to get started with their treatment. That's a bit of a touchy subject because a lot of people don't know where the best place to put an adolescent patient is these days. And that's always a struggle for us. For the geography, some people say, well, gosh, there's a lot of people from this town or that town, or what if you're up north, or what if you're by power lines, or what if you're downtown Toronto. It, it's really anywhere and everywhere. We're lucky to have an organization like POGO, the Pediatric Oncology Group of Ontario, who tracks very, very detailed location geography, postal code, history information on patients in an anonymous setting, and they really have never seen any reproducible data for regional distribution of, of any brain tumor. And so if a town has two or three kids diagnosed within a year, boy, I can tell you they're going to feel that impact. They're going to think there's something going on in our water, there's something in our schools, there's something in, our, in, the, uh, you know, in the air, but it just doesn't come out that way in the, in the statistics. Um, and the geography is also, for the most part, with rare exceptions, worldwide in distribution. You can always find places that don't have as many brain tumors, but they do tend to be places that don't have as ready access to MRI technology. So countries, if you can't get an MRI, if it's really hard to, you just won't see as many brain tumors. It's very rare. We see far less than 300 new cases on average in, in a year. And for our adult colleagues, this would look amazing because this might be uh, all in a month's work or a week's work for some tumors. Um, it, so it is dealing with a very niche specialty. And the incidence, although I hear a lot people coming to me and saying, well, we know that the incidence is going up. We know that people are getting more brain tumors. We know this. Uh, well, we don't actually. And, and there was a huge spike in, in brain tumors in the 70s when MRIs became available. Uh, um, finding tumors that we would never have found before, but uh, it, it really isn't an incidence that can be proven. It's not on the rise. These numbers vary by population. If a town increases by a million people, you are going to see a few more brain tumors. So who are the patients? Again, so getting to my stock images of patients that remind me of some of the actual people I am lucky enough to work with. Um, you know, the, these are some of my patients. I see tumors where large parts of the brain. You don't have to be a radiologist to see the black part here, and that's where a tumor used to sit. And this may look like, how could you possibly even be alive with this? But patient, my patient with this exact MRI is walking around doing this kind of thing. Who are the patients? They're patients you may not be able to see walking down the street, or you might. They're patients who may be suffering greatly from this, or it may look like they have had nothing happen to them. So the patients, we can't, you always have to really think, when we're looking at MRIs, and, and I have to remind the parents and myself this sometimes, we can't just look at this. We can't look at it as a two-dimensional mapping. This is three-dimensional child in front of us is the most important thing. Who treats the pediatric brain tumors? Well, right, out, right from the get-go, obviously, a concerned parent bringing their child to a family doctor or a pediatrician is a vital part of the whole process. If nobody's diagnosing these kids, then we don't see them. They usually end up in the emergency room or through an emergency doctor's referral. Um, and not always, but sometimes they come straight to the main team. The diagnostic part are two different kinds of doctors, a radiologist and a pathologist, the ones who find the imaging and the actual tumor name. And then the surgery, oncology, and radiation aspect of it, 
would kind of be the three, three cornerstones of how we treat these kids with a whole lot of other specialists required to address the needs that come up from the tumor and, their, and the damage that it can cause. Um, endocrinologists look after hormones, neurologists look after seizures, and ophthalmologists look after the eyes and, and the eye exams along the way. But the team obviously is enormous and, and probably missing some very key people on slides like this. But who looks after the patients and families? It's, it's a giant team. Obviously, you know, missing on this list is the whole community and the whole city and the town or the schools that rally around families. But nursing is, is really kind of the, the foundation of everything that these families go through. And when I say I give chemotherapy, I don't give chemotherapy at all. The nurses do. Um, child life specialists are, allow us to do our jobs with kids, kids that need procedures and MRIs and chemo and things that are painful and, and, and difficult become easier when you have somebody who, whose training is entirely based on getting them uh, through that procedure. Social work and, and the rehab team, the dietitians, neuropsychology, looking at the cognitive side and, and the emotional side through psychology, uh, all of these people are working together and it's an incredible team atmosphere that, that really um, makes makes it enjoyable and adds an element of support. We can be there for each other and understand our jobs um, and the families we serve better by working together. We look at where kids are treated. This is a very important concept. The kids have to be treated in a pediatric center. So. Uh, this might not have been the case decades ago. Certainly, if you were an excellent surgeon in Guelph and you saw a kid with a brain tumor, a 14-year-old, uh, by all means, uh, the, you know, the field of pediatric neurosurgery was not robust enough that you had to send them somewhere. If you were comfortable, you could do the operation. That's proven to, to not serve the patients in the best way. Every child needs to be brought to a specialized center, and there are only four with surgical services in the province. The only place you can start is London Hamilton Toronto and Ottawa, who all have excellent pediatric neurosurgeons. Kingston has a pediatric hospital, but they usually rely on Toronto for their major surgeries. They, we have a lot of satellite centers which serve the patients well afterwards, especially giving chemo or, or some follow-up treatments, and these are usually linked through the pediatric oncology group. And then occasionally we make referrals to the United States, and we have lots of different means and mechanisms to do that. but. It's, it's actually pretty rare. We have uh, good clinical trial engagement in Canada. Um, there are some specialized technologies like proton beam radiation, which have a very, very specific role for some kinds of tumors. And we have mechanisms to send kids to the States if that's a benefit to them. Um, sometimes in Canada, we know that we feel hard done by, you know, with kind of a media message that our healthcare system is not as good as the States. I can tell you, working in Boston, uh, the kind of the epicenter that uh, we have a lot of advantages that Canadians do not appreciate. And um, you don't have to be there for very long to understand how good our healthcare system is in general, quality of care wise. But we bring kids into environments that look sometimes similar and sometimes very different than an adult hospital, sometimes a little bit friendlier. We have amazing playrooms and toys and uh, we try to help kids through like a, you know, a simulated play CT scanner so that doesn't become as, as uh, you know, scary to them. Usually the chemotherapy is given in chairs looking at the you know, video games that are never quite as modern as the kids want them to be, never quite the version like, where's 5.0? Uh, um, and then, and then we have treatment rooms and exam rooms, and the kids hopefully are coming into an environment that they increasingly become more comfortable with along the way. We get into brain tumors this, this whole weekend, uh, you know, starts with the same concept. This part doesn't necessarily change whether you're an adult or a kid, but it really starts with one cell in the brain, a cell that has mismatched some information, some signaling, something has gone wrong, something is being carried forward. It's like a typo in an important email that just keeps getting passed on and passed on, and all of a sudden you've got a really bad message that bears no similarities to the beginning. It's a genetic error that slips through the cracks that we have, and that's what it all starts from. It's not a part of your brain that, was, that, was, uh, that has gone wrong. It starts with a cell that divides and divides and divides, and and may spread to other parts of the brain or spine. Um, so this is very different. A lot of adults who may have a brain tumor, it, it could come from another part of the body. Breast cancer and other types of cancers can spread, and most of the time what we're talking about is a primary brain tumor. Um, I've seen all of the ones on this list, um, but really what's important that every family wants to know immediately is it benign or malignant? And people just come in, whoa, whoa, what are you talking about? Brain tumor sounds like, I don't even know what you mean. 
Um, these are words that I try my best to stay away from entirely in pediatric oncology because this side is far more important. Uh, the most benign tumor that I treat in the worst location could be fatal, could make a child blind, could make them deaf, could limit their life, um, even more than a malignant tumor that we can cut out safely and then treat. Um, so the location, location, location is, is the most important part. You have a tight space in your brain with lots of important things, and this is really what it all comes down to. The age of the child makes an enormous difference, and I suppose there's similarities in adults. I know my adult colleagues struggle when they have somebody who, you know, if you have a 95-year-old patient who it would, would require a powerful kind of chemo, that might not be the right decision for them. The same thing applies on the other end of life. If you have a six-month-old baby with a tumor that you would normally treat with radiation, that's not going to be a feasible treatment for them. That is not going to lead to any outcomes that would be tolerable for any human. Um, and so we have to rethink our strategies and come back to what can we give this patient safely based on their age. And so that's very different than treating uh, the, the, the majority of the teenage to adult years where you can pick the solution for the tumor itself and not just the age of the person. And the tumor subtype is something not only the type but the genetic subtype, the molecular genetics within that. We're starting to really dig under the hood and try to find what is making these tumors tick and what is making two tumors that look the same under the microscope so different. So getting back to the concept of benign versus malignant, I treat patients with optic pathway gliomas and optic pathway gliomas sit right on the optic nerve. If you were to take a piece of them, they are incredibly benign. They, they have no malignant histology whatsoever. Um, but for patients uh, who have this blocking or, or interfering with the optic nerve, it can make them blind. It can cause vision loss. It can grow further back into the head and cause all kinds of developmental problems. So for these patients living with this benign tumor, there's, there's nothing about this that, would, that they would sign up for if they had a choice. These can be incredibly difficult to treat. Um, they can be incredibly frustrating for families because they have that, you know, we're not quite in the cancer zone, but this is something that is severely impacting my child's life and, and will always be there. So we look after a lot of patients like this and, uh, and again, it's the example, if you had the same tumor sitting right out here, a competent surgeon could cure you of that tumor in about three hours or less and, and here there's no surgeon, unless you are completely blind, there's no surgeon who wants to touch this because you're going to be completely blind. So it's very important to think what causes a brain tumor. These are spontaneous random events for the vast, vast, vast majority. We have all kinds of theories, and I think that we, I mean we as a society, we as people, we as philosophical, spiritual people, we think of different things that could lead to a brain tumor. But these are random events. These are not caused by uh, toxins or cell phones or, or uh, something that mom did when she was pregnant or something that dad's work uh, you know, brought home in terms of chemicals or, or things that you live too close to this or that. These are rare spontaneous events. The exceptions may be less than 5% of the patients I see have a genetic syndrome they're born with. I'll give you an example, neurofibromatosis type 1. Many people have heard of it, maybe if you haven't, it's one of the most common genetic disorders on earth. Um, if you have it, you can have a perfectly normal life, but you have a 5 to 10% chance of having a brain tumor. Uh, that's much higher than anybody else uh, who doesn't have NF1. So they may be linked, it doesn't tell us what causes it, but we know that there are mechanisms within the cell that are rearranged and that may lead you to a predisposition, remembering of course that then 90% of people with NF1 do not get brain tumors, so it's not an explanation in and of itself. 1% uh, or less, at least in my population, would be linked to a previous treatment and that is essentially high dose radiation. So patients that have had radi radiation when they're two, I've even seen by the time they're late teenagers the development of tumors like a meningioma. Something we have to go back to them and say, well, it, this may have and probably was caused or, or contributed to by the treatment you had for the first tumor, but hopefully we needed to do that and that's why we're lucky enough to live to a secondary tumor and many of those can be dealt with surgically um, along the way. But we really, despite trying, we have no link to lifestyle, diet, vaccines, toxins. This is true across the board of the vast majority of pediatric cancers. Uh, I think we, people can appreciate how difficult, how many decades it took to establish a link between cancer, lung cancer, and smoking. Uh, and that's you know, still the vast majority of people who smoke don't get lung cancer. This is something there are no links. And despite the fact that we say that, I know that 
parents come in and think, but we eat organic food and we only eat healthy and our kids are healthy. The healthiest people and the least healthy people get the same number of brain tumors. Yes. I, I, th I think it's inherent in all of our genes. I think it's the same, you know, because our genes are constantly doing things. You're constantly making proteins, you're constantly making a new cell. There's the opportunity for billions of mistakes a day in our DNA, and it's just that we have mechanisms to correct almost all of those. So it's one of those mistakes getting through that didn't get caught by the next 17 spell checkers. That's what leads to that cell becoming a tumor. It's just the mass complexity. It's exactly how I would put it. And, you know, when if we think like red meat somewhat linked to cancer, you're talking about a very specific type of cancer, certain types of very specific colon cancer in certain populations, not a risk of lung cancer from eating red meat. Like they're, they're very specific. And I think in kids um, in, in, in the brain, you already have a limited exposure to toxicity. Our brains are very good at keeping the bad stuff out. So almost at any age, you, you really haven't acquired the same kind of DNA damage that you would get from smoking and radiation to the rest of our bodies in some ways. But it is really the complexity that comes down to it, and that's maybe why they're so rare. Um, again, kind of thinking, what are the symptoms? Well, it all depends on where it is very much. It, 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 with brain tumor itself doesn't mean anything because if you have a tiny tumor up here compared to a huge tumor down here, those are going to be very different concepts. Um, but really, progressively worse headaches. I think every parent with a child who has migraines has wondered in a worried sense, you know, could this possibly be a brain tumor? Really, the brain tumor headaches become quite distinct. They become quite progressive. They become very alarming uh, along the way. And so they usually wake kids up from sleep. They, they wake up with headaches, kind of a pattern you don't see with migraines. Migraines get better when you go to sleep. Brain tumor headaches get worse when you go to sleep. Um, vomiting, same thing. Kids are always vomiting. They're getting gastro as soon as they go to daycare and, and onwards. But Kids don't wake up in the morning, have excessive vomiting, and then feel great all day long and do that over and over again. And kids with brain tumors causing pressure do that. Some kids come in with, and the only thing they've got is a hormone imbalance. They come in and they're, they, they've told the pediatrician their kid's drinking eight or nine liters of water a day and peeing 10 liters. So they're getting dehydrated despite drinking. And that's just a tiny little protein in the middle of our brain coming out of the pituitary. And these kids can come in with the tiniest little tumor right there that will grow and grow and grow until it causes destruction. And it takes a, a very keen family doctor or pediatrician to pick up on that early and get them an MRI that they need. Um, and again, it's not the well-hydrated kid, it's the kid who's getting dehydrated while drinking. Vision problems, kids coming in with double vision is always very concerning. They will typically not tell anybody about it. Younger kids especially, they will just cover their eye while they're watching cartoons, tilt their head if it helps their vision. They're not going to be alarmed because they don't know that's abnormal, and they will be staring at the TV, fixing the problem on their own, and they're not going to say, hey, I see slightly blurry vision when I turn my head this way. Um, so sometimes kids have very distinct double vision by the time we see them, but eye movement difficulties based on the brain's control is a big problem for us. Because um, sometimes that doesn't get better with treatment. Walking it can either be balance issues from the back of our brain, which controls our balance, or weakness issues from one side of the body, um, one leg or, or one arm that's, that's distinctly weaker than the other. Uh, much less common than adults. Uh, we, we can see seizures in kids, but, but very rarely for, mo for the serious brain tumors that I treat. Um, it tends to be something in adults, if you're 40 and you have a seizure, you're going to think brain tumor until proven otherwise. But in kids, you're going to think things like a fever causing a seizure or any number of normal things that happen to kids. Um, it's rare that I, that I see a seizure presenting as a serious brain tumor even though that tends to be what people are worried about. And then potentially hearing problems along the way. There are tumors that can encroach right on the nerve uh, that, that allows kids to hear, and that can be an early sign as well. So the families go, not do through, go through, sorry. Um, what do they go through? Well, they go through a lot of worry, typically. Some, some, it happens too quick to be worried, but most families are very worried. Most families have had to tell the story again and again and again. Um, to themselves, to their doctor, to the emergency room. Um, 
A physical exam can sometimes tell us what's going on and sometimes can't. Some kids have a normal exam coming in. The CT or MRI scan that somebody is smart enough to order is typically the first time we see there's a problem. And then, and then they have to meet the team. If it's really urgent, they typically go straight to a neurosurgeon. And if it's non-urgent, they're going to go to our clinic and we're going to have a discussion if it's something that's not causing life-threatening symptoms. If it is, they're going to go to the OR. Surgery is, is the most likely path after that to find out what's going on so that we can get the diagnosis. And then they're going to come up with a treatment plan and then some period of observation which may be part of the treatment plan, but it may be just the observ normal observation for life. <clears throat> when we pull up that first MRI, you can imagine the shock of, of you know, for the family, kind of all of your worst things coming true. Um, I put this picture up because a lot of my patients with this type of tumor do have to wear an eye patch. Some of them think it's fun, many don't. Um, but this basically usually presses on nerves that help the eyes move, in which case a child will have no double vision if they can only see out of one eye, and that can be very helpful for them. But the location, again, of the tumor, this could be benign or a very malignant lesion, but being in the heart of the brain like this, in the middle of it, uh, can be where all of the symptoms come from. And after you get that MRI, the different treatment paths so that people sometimes forget about, they think, well, it's just going to be surgery and I'm done, or everybody gets radiation, but it's really multiple different paths. Many of my patients split into one of these. Observation only can be a reasonable pa pathway. If there's no change in that tumor, there's nothing you can do that's going to help that kid. We're going to observe, and if you need to switch gears later on, you can. Surgery only. Some patients have a tumor, again, like I said, accessible, removable, it's taken out, that's it, they're done, and now everything is about rehab and follow-up. Surgery and then radiation, or chemo following radiation is a pathway for most of our malignant tumors. Chemotherapy maintenance, which means I'm going to use chemotherapy at very low doses over months or years to prevent the growth of the tumor, that's a possibility for some patients, even without surgery. And surgery for the young patients where you can't use radiation, we usually go into an intensive chemotherapy, so intensive that they need their own stem cells to support them going through. And that can be something that, uh, that, that we use to make up the difference when we can't use radiation for patients. That, that's kind of what we, a trick we've developed over the past 15, 20 years. So it all comes down to the treatments, some variety of these or none of them. But basically when families have to go through surgery, they're looking at many hours in the OR. It's got to be probably the hardest day of their lives for a lot of it. It's got to be a, an incredible thing waiting for that surgery team to come out and, and say what actually happened. Um, most patients need to be in the intensive care for a little while. Yes? Yeah, yes, yes. So, so for, the, for the most part, exactly. Um, either that it is the benign histology, or it's, even if it is malignant, there are still a few that if we take all of it out, we, we don't have to do anything else. There's no added benefit to radiation. It will never come back again. Um, so there are some forms of, of, of tumors that are accessible, and it's just that concept of whether you can get all of it or not. And that would be the surgery only patients. Yeah, I'm here. That's right. Yes, yes, exactly. And so medulloblastoma, so what you're talking about, that tumor is the most common of the malignant uh, tumors that we treat. The big difference there is that no surgeon can ever get all of the medulloblastoma cells. It's completely impossible. And we learned that the hard way 50, 60 years ago or more, when the best surgeons would take out all of the tumor and it would come back 100% of the time. So. In order to show up on an ERM, the, on the MRI scan, there has to be 
probably over a million cells in that area. So to say that there's nothing on the MRI, and this is very hard for me, it's hard for the parents, to nothing on the MRI, it's clear, you're assuming there's less than a million cells there. That, that's the concept. So we're cleaning up the difference. How do you know when you get it all? When you believe you got it all, then how do you know Yeah, that, that's, that's a great point. So, so one technique, like, like you said, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but the, uh, the MRI afterwards tells you that you've got everything you can see, and it's going to be the, the actual tumor type that tells you whether that's okay or not. Um, you know, it's, and, and that's behavior of the tumor. We can say definitively, only through experience, that medulloblastoma always comes back, so therefore there always, was, there always were cells left behind. Whereas uh, a grade one, what we call a pilocytic astrocytoma, if you get out everything that you can see, historically, we can tell you you're 90% done. Like 90% of those patients will never have regrowth. So somehow you got all of it. Um, I think it's the invasiveness of the tumor into the surrounding tissues. I think that's what you're talking about. If you had a tumor on your, in the bone of your forearm and you did an amputation at the shoulder, you, you would hope that you 100% got all of it. You can't take that kind of amputation out of the brain. That's, that's the biggest problem. You're being so careful not to take any normal. Definitely, yeah. Yep, yes, that's right. That's right, yeah, it's a really good point because there are some tumors, you, you can't see that kind of local invasiveness, the, the kind of fingers that might go out into the surrounding uh, area, but what you can see is where it creeps around corners and the surgeons can say, if we go in there, we're gonna damage all kinds of nerves it's going to be too dangerous to go digging deep into that area of the brain. So the shape of it creeping around a corner may be the reason you say, there's no way realistically we got all of that. And then you come out and say, what are we going to do about that? Because it's left over. Yeah, that's exactly a very, very good point. Um, so for example, the surgeons, what we hope to do is go from here to here. This is the before where the tumor is this slightly lighter shade, but completely blocking a part of the brain. And years later, you hope that the patient ends up with a clean resection cavity. This would be, there's no visible tumor. There's a bit of an outline, just surgical scar, but no tumor growing back. And this is many years difference between them. But this area would have been treated with radiation all around here, chemotherapy as well, in order to make sure the cells didn't grow back in that area. But when we say that these scans afterwards are, are normal, we actually use, I use the word clear, um, and that's to say it, that this is a, an, an area of the brain that, that is not gonna look like any other kids who hasn't had surgery, but there's no tumor there. So we're trying to say, you know, I'm trying to say you're cured, but what I'm really saying is there's nothing there it's clear, and, uh, and I've had that discussion with parents. I'm like, well, what does that mean? And you say stable or clear. Why don't, why don't you just tell me it's normal? It's because this is your brain for life, and it may work very well, but it may not be normal compared to another tumor. Under the microscope, um, this is what the pathologist is stuck with, trying to find the difference between the different tumors here, trying to look for patterns, and these are usually what they look like. Uh, they can use different stains to come up with different colors, but when patients ask me, why is it taking so long to get my pathology back? It's because I want to trust this person, this doctor, to spend as much time as they want squinting at these pictures to see what the difference is between these. Uh, and I don't want to rush that. I want the right answer. I, I never want the fast answer. Um, so it's a really, really hard job, and that surprises a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they use words like small, round, blue cell to describe the type, the kind of family of tumor they think it's in, and then they use special stains to kind of get towards a, an answer. But the short answer is no, the tumors... Exactly, exactly. I think that, that can be a really hard part in a benign lesion, a more benign lesion, that they're actually saying, 
I'm having a hard time telling what's normal brain and what's tumor brain, even though we know from the MRI it's tumor. That, that can happen too. Families go through radiation, which is treatments 10 to 15 minutes a day for four weeks or six weeks. Uh, the radiation machines are, are very daunting looking, but they're very sophisticated robotic arms with computers that map out exactly where the only, this patient, our patients are typically asleep, but this patient's just watching a video to distract them on DVD. And the only reason the looks so uh, disturbing here is this is a plastic mold to hold the head in the same place every day um, so that the radiation can always aim at the same parts of the brain, very important. And our patients do amazingly well. Child life helps them through. There's a, uh, a stuffed animal here for them and for comfort. Some patients, if you're three or four, you might need to be put to sleep for 10 minutes. But this is something that they, they tolerate surprisingly well. And, and we have an amazing radiation team that looks after these kids. Uh, and then chemotherapy, that sounds like a vague term. Many people, if you haven't experienced it, you may not, it might just sound scary. It just means medications, but it can be anything out of these four or more. Um, many of my patients are admitted to hospital for a few days every month for just IV chemo in hospital. Some patients are coming to my clinic every week. They never get admitted to hospital, but they come every week to the same appointment for IV chemo in clinic. Other patients will have oral chemotherapy that their parents have to give at home every day. They never come to clinic for chemo, they're just taking pills or liquid at home, uh, which has its own challenges, as you can imagine. And then more intensive chemotherapy can require um, the, that hospital stay that I mentioned with their own stem cells being reinfused and a, uh, basically a, a really intensified approach where patients might even be in the hospital for um, two or three months uh, recovering from that. But that, those are all chemotherapy. Um, chemotherapy just looks usually like a liquid in a bag hooked up to an IV, but it can affect all different parts of our body and a lot of my job is looking after kids, looking for side effects and making sure that we make those as good as possible. The, you know, the, probably the most important medication that's ever come out in curing cancer is ondansetron to treat nausea and vomiting because that changed the way we could look at the medications we are allowed to give to kids who otherwise would never make it through the treatment and so it kind of a tool to allow us to, to get through that um, by minimizing the nausea. And then the toughest part of my job, who survives? Who do we cure? And I, I always hope that by the time I retire, it's, it's everyone. But I've got everything across the board from tumors that are 100% or 95% curable to some tumors that we really in any center in the planet have not cured by 2018. Um, uh, some, of the, some of the patients with t tumors deep, deep in the brain stem have survival curves with every trial that we've ever done falling off at a year or two or three uh, with really no long-term survivors. Um, and some patients um, in some subgroups would have patients, populations that are 100% survivor. We've never had anybody fail that treatment. The tumors never come back. And sometimes that's finding the subgroup within this, and sometimes it's just a tumor that you know is going to respond to the treatment you have in 2018. Um, but then, aside from the stuff that we do, there's sometimes just kids that we watch. Sometimes we see kids with a lesion. It's a vague lesion. If you can see the white spot here, it's not supposed to be there. The patient comes to us, the doctor, the radiology report says there's a brain tumor sitting there. We examine the kid, we say, well, do you have any problems? No. Um, I can catch a frisbee, I can play. Well, you know what, if we, he got this scan for a different reason, these headaches, but that has nothing to do with this at all. There's no way this could cause headaches, actually. There's nothing, there's no pain receptors in this part of your brain. So we say, you know what, if we take that out, you're going to have dizziness and you're going to have walking problems. You may have speech problems. Let's just do an MRI in three months and then six months and then nine months. Maybe you'll have that until you die at 95 or something else. Maybe you've had it since you were born. So we have to be careful not to overtreat patients. And again, that concept of finding the right balance for following kids and making sure we haven't overdone it. We follow kids for life. At Mac, uh, McMaster, where I work, I, I can see people, if they want to come and see us when they're 40 or 30, uh, you know, as long as they don't need surgery, if they're just coming to see our team for follow-up, we do MRI scans and checkups and eventually start spreading out that, but just that educational piece that comes with, with their visits. 
But we also get into a lot of supportive stuff later on, neurocognitive testing, so that they can have the most school and hopefully job and vocational support as possible, whatever that means to the family and to them. Um, neurocognitive testing is that like, you know, IQ testing, but way beyond that. So how does your brain work and where would you get uh, the most bang for your buck if, if teachers were giving you extra time or memory aids or something? Um, Growth and endocrine function, the kind of hormones that take us through puberty, but far more than that, the thyroid hormones and the, and the steroid hormones that allow us to function as human beings can all be affected. And this is an incredibly important thing to watch in kids, as you can imagine. It's important in adults, but for kids, they're constantly changing. We want to get them through their growth phase of their life as good as we can. Eye exams to make sure that their eyes are functioning, but they're also maximizing their vision with glasses if needed or surgery if needed. Hearing tests for those kids that have hearing problems, blood work, sometimes to look at kidney function and stuff like that. And then a lot of the psychology support and mentorship that can happen through support groups and camps and trips and things where that person has to find where all of this fits into their real life, because that's the stuff we do in our visits. Um, but we want the kids who come in with you know, absolutely horrendous looking massive tumors, who end up with surgery that takes out what looks like maybe half their brain, to be looking as good as this kid, which this patient is, running around playing, uh, totally amazing you, um, dealing with a lot of these issues, but really having what we hope to be a normal life. Uh, as much as as much as possible in that context, the long term side effects are not minimal, and it varies completely for every person. So any kids that we've actually treated, we can continue to follow. So if we have somebody, like again, this, uh, this, this tumor here, this is a patient we would transfer because we just followed and followed and followed. They were 18. Now they need somebody who can continue to follow and do something about it. Because what we can't do is our pediatric surgeons can't do surgery on an adult. It, it's, it goes both ways. Um, the adults can't do surgery and, on, on ours and vice versa. So uh, as long as we've treated any, any kid, it can be seen for life. Um, probably the big three, I mean, it's up to the patient to tell us what the big three are, but, but emotional, psychologic, kind of referencing how you put that into your life, the neurocognitive impact for some patients on their brain functioning, either a very specific or global part, and neurologic deficits, weakness on one side, eye movements, swallowing problems. Um, these are big, big noticeable ones, and other things that the patients may not notice as much, but we follow and we give them perspective on along the way. Um, many people are very worried about secondary tumors. Uh, they're very, very rare, less than 1 or 2%. That's still, a, that's still too many. But there's something that I do a lot of teaching around because I don't want people to live with the fear of that, but I do want them to live with the empowerment of going to a doctor if something ever happened that they didn't understand. So we have to think about research that we're doing, whether it's the kind of classic laboratory research of what makes science, what makes cancer tick, and how do we block the cancer cell pathways that, that drive the tumor development? How do we find who are the best risk groups and the worst risk, and how do we use less of treatments that we know can be harmful? So less radiation would be all of our goal. How can we do that safely? Because if I cut out the radiation in, in the patient relapses, I haven't done them any favors. Um, can we use more targeted chemotherapy and, and in hoping to avoid some of the long-term issues that we know we're contributing to with the treatments that are required? And of course, a big part of, of what we would like to know more about is resiliency. Why are some patients so resilient during their treatment and after their treatment, and how do we, how do we convey that uh, kind of technique and ability and personality to the population uh, and how do we support them through that? What we're not good at yet, I say, I, and, and the surgeons might get mad, mad at me, but I want to know the diagnosis without having to do surgery. I want a blood test or I want a scan to tell me exactly what that is. And one day we will get there. A quick blood test will tell me, you have this type of medulloblastoma. Forget the surgery, we're going to shrink it without even doing a, a scar, uh, a, a surgery and, and causing the potential damage there. Um, 
when to, to cut out radiation or use less of it. And then as, a, as the medications, I can say targeted agents, but I'm talking about very expensive and hard to get medications, which might not even work. So how are we going to take a system that, that goes from very cheap uh, generic chemotherapy to incredibly expensive um, specific medications? We don't really know the really long-term impact. I mean, like how are, we don't have 70 and 80 year old survivors from most of our childhood malignant diseases and brain tumors because we haven't been curing them for that long. So we, we don't know what's gonna happen really long-term. And cognitive improvement is something that's kind of a, um, uh, you know, kind of a golden idea for everybody. How do we make people's brains work if we use 10% of our brain? How do we use the other 90%? And of course, globally, how would we make sure everybody in the world has access to the kind of treatments we're talking about? What keeps me up at night? Well, again, we don't know what causes brain tumors, so it's that, that, that troubles me. Um, two, two minutes? One minute? Yeah. Um, so just two more slides. We don't know the right amount of treatment for any one patient. We don't know why they relapse, why patients would still relapse despite all the best treatment in the world. And there's some tumors we just don't know how to treat at all. Um, I, I struggle with the fact we don't know how to navigate what is the truth and what is out there. So you see something like this. This pops up on Google as soon as you uh, you put like childhood cancer and it, Mexico's miracle ch cancer treatment. Um, I struggle with this and I do this and all of my colleagues across North America, I know practically everybody who treats childhood brain tumors and we don't know these kids and yet we see them on the news and we hear about them and, they see, and all the parents see them on Facebook. Well, so and so went and got cured. Um, but, but I struggle with how do we convey that, and not to crush hope, but to say what, what's going to be the, re, the real information out there. Um, so we're going to do better by understanding the problem, doing research, and supporting families throughout the entire trajectory of their lives. And thanks to amazing organizations, not only the Brain Tumor Foundation, are, we're very lucky to have the pediatric oncology group here. Uh, all the people that put together the amazing books and stories of their journey and then these incredible places like the camps, the children's camps in, of, of Ontario and Canada, the Make-A-Wish and Children's Wish, which, which really have life-changing trips for kids, um, Tip of the Toes, which takes survivors out in the middle of uh, the Arctic and, and does incredible things, and these people and the community around them are, are, are really making the biggest difference. Okay, come on in. We have a few more chairs. We'll hope, hope for some latecomers. Um, welcome and thank you so much for being here, everybody. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, I said, surviving and thriving. And I was started off with a kind of a survivorship talk, but then kind of my philosophy got in the way. My philosophy is you're thriving and surviving a brain tumor the minute you find out that you have one. And it starts that day. It's not this kind of, uh, well, you, you hit a two-year cure mark or five years. Like I've had parents say, well, when I am hit five years, I'm cured, right? And like, no, nothing happens at five years. You're cured the day that, that that last tumor cell was taken out or when the last tumor cell died from chemo or radiation. Um, but your survivor, the minute you find out, and the minute you find out your MRI came back, you're thriving, you're surviving. And we see that in our patients. It's maybe what draws me to pediatrics in the first place, because kind of kids have a lot of that attitude built in right away. And they're up playing as soon as they wake up from their sedation from their MRI. They're, they're not letting any of that slow them down. They're not like, oh, I better stop living for a bit because I just found out I had a brain tumor. They're just off to the races as soon as they feel good. Um, but I think that's where I'm coming from. So I'm not going to talk about like what happens to you 10 years after you're done. If you find out you have a brain tumor and the life expectancy is, you know, two years, like we just saw with Gord Downey, look what he crammed into those two years of his life, right? And we, we reflect on that. And that's more living than I think uh, myself or most of us will ever do. Um, so it's all part of the journey. My I don't have any financial disclosures, and I've stolen a lot of cute kid pictures from Google Images, stock photos. They all look r remarkably similar to my patients, but they're not my patients. I just wanted representation. So I'm really just going to look at an overview of kind of the wha who, what, when, why, and how a pediatric brain tumor journey and what that means for, for the short term and long term. Um, because we're streaming, and for anybody in the room, who wants to and has a, a smartphone, um, if you, 
if you go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O, and just type in B-T-N-C, then you, it just comes up with a screen. You can just type any question in, and it'll pop up on my computer so I can read it. So if anybody's watching streaming, I have no idea how many millions of people are watching this, but if you feel like you have a question, please just type it in, and it'll come up here. I'll try to pay attention, and, um, and then we can answer questions as we go. Anybody in the room who's not afraid to ask, please just put up your hand, and we will have a discussion at any time, because my slides are, are just slides. Um, the story is much bigger than them. So I'm a pediatric hematologist, oncologist, I look after kids with all kinds of cancer, blood disorders, and my specialty is in brain tumors. Having started and ended, not ended, but started and come back around to my training at McMaster, uh, I've been kind of seen how things are done coast to coast, so to speak, and uh, have garnered that experience in the con and the uh, connections across North America. What we do in pediatrics is a really small niche um, population with a very limited number of clinicians. So I kind of know everybody in the continent who treats kids with brain tumors, and we try to do things in a similar fashion. Um, but my clinical job, therefore, is to take that expertise and, and really know everything there is to know about the prognosis and treatment options for any type of brain tumor in kids. I'm not a surgeon. I come up with a treatment plan and direct the whole thing accordingly. And philosophically, uh, I mean, I think most of us would say we're trying to find how much treatment do we have to give. We want to cure kids. We want to get rid of tumors forever. But what can we get away with? How little can we get away with? We don't want to over-treat. Um, we, we don't want to give higher doses of chemo or radiation than we had to. And, and in order to do that and, and make everything better for the next generation, we have to engage in high-quality research. So everything we do is supposed to be research in pediatric oncology, at least until we cure every kid with no side effects. And then it won't be research anymore. So what do we know? You've heard probably here lifetime risk for all of us, not just pediatric tumors, but all of us with brain cancer is somewhere in the 1 in 150. You probably, um, you know, it, may, it hovers around that number. But in kids, it's a lot more rare than that. It's just that it's the second most common group of cancers next to leukemia for children. Um, so it happens to children of all ages. It is the leading cause of solid tumor death in children. So although many children are cured, if you look at a comparison to bone tumors and muscle tumors and kidney tumors, the out overall outcomes are, are worse with brain tumors. And uh, just in perspective, at McMaster Children's, where I work, we only see about 25 or 30 new patients per year, which is kind of maybe what the adults see in a week or something. So it's a very small, proportionally small um, field. But anybody can get a brain tumor. I've had newborn babies who had brain tumors detected on MRI uh, before they were even born. We had to start treatment. Um, geography, anywhere and everywhere. So it's really, for the most part, not based on where you live, what town you're from. Families always feel the impact. If there's two or three kids in a community, oh boy, it's going to be what's in the water, what's going on with our you know, power lines or something. But that never plays out over time with the statistics we have. It, it happens more frequently when the population of a city goes up. It's proportional to that. There's no increase in the incidence. We've tracked that ever since we've had robust MRI technology. There is no rise in pediatric brain tumor numbers. The only numbers that have gone up at McMaster are exactly directly linked to, this, to the number of people in the region that we serve, and the same goes for every hospital in North America. So I hear that a lot. People, parents say to me, to very matter of fact, they say, well, we know that cancer is on the rise in kids. And, and it, I say, well, we don't know that. We certainly don't know that for brain tumors, and there's no evidence of that whatsoever. When we got MRI machines, there was a huge jump in the number of brain tumors being diagnosed because we could see them for the first time. It's very rare across the country as well. But getting away from the numbers, the patients are the most important part of the story, and I try not to focus too much on these scary-looking pictures because sometimes the families just 
they just want to see what does the picture show and of course they get to see this every day i don't so when they come into my clinic it's it's this is what i want to look at first um this is again google stock images but very similar to the patient of mine that has this exact scan with i don't know if you can appreciate the back of the room but a very large area that has been resected where there used to be a tumor and a patient who surprisingly is able to do all of the things that they want to do it's um it's remarkable and there's not necessarily a good connection between what the mri how bad the mri looks and what that kid can walk around and play and do and say um and that goes both ways. Some kids with tiny little tumors are un unable to do things that I would expect them to do. Sometimes kids with half of their brain removed are perfectly functional and you would never know seeing them except for the scar in their head. So who treats pediatric brain tumors? Well, you, you need a whole you know, village. Um, certainly things start with p usually the family doctor or the pediatrician and then sometimes will end up in the emergency room uh, with emergency doctor trying to pick up on what is important, uh, what's going to get that kid a scan or not. The radiologist looks at the MRI scans, the pathologist looks at the actual tissue. So these are the diagnostic doctors behind the scenes. And the real upfront doctors are the neurosurgeons, the pediatric oncologists like me, and the radiation doctors who are adult trained, but, but the ones we deal with have a specialization in pediatrics as well. And then a big team of other specialists who support these kids with all of their needs. Endocrinologists look after hormones, neurologists look after seizures, ophthalmologists look after eye problems, and we need these people to really fill in all of those gaps. Who looks after the patients and families? Well, this, this is a much bigger picture. So the, the cornerstone of what we do, you know, I, I don't give chemo, the nurses give chemo. I just decide on it. Um, nursing is a foundation of looking after these patients in hospital and in the community as well. And you know, we couldn't do our work without child life specialists, getting kids through the hardest procedures. We're lucky at Mac to have a kind of one of the foundational child life specialty programs, and these people make a huge difference to what kids can and cannot do. Um, social work is a vital part of supporting families and the kids themselves. With the rehab team, neuropsychology for assessments, psychology, dietitians, um, it really, right break down to the pharmacists who are specializing in that type of, of care. An enormous number of people, probably not on the list, but never forgetting about the communities, the school supports, the teachers who go above and beyond, and everybody else who looks after the patients and families throughout this difficult time. And kids have to be treated, it's very, very important, kids have to be treated in a major pediatric center. In 2018, in this decade, you cannot have your tumor diagnosed in, in Guelph and the best surgeon in the world is there. They cannot operate on a kid's tumor. Um, we've decided and shown through the evidence that, that that is something the kids have to be transferred to one of the four major pediatric surgical centers uh, and no child and anybody 18 or under should ever have, or I guess under 18, should ever have a surgery for a brain tumor outside of one of these centers in Ontario anyway. Pediatric centers do have satellite centers linked to them, and a network of POGO, Pediatric Oncology Group Centers, serves these patients very well for things like chemo and blood work, and they, and they provide incredible support local, closer to home. Um, and once in a while, we have really good ways to access care in the United States when we need to. So some families just have it built into their heads thanks to the media and misperceptions that American healthcare is better. I can tell you having worked there, it is not universally true. And it is so um, hard to hear that for, as a kind of built-in assumption. We have incredible care here. If kids need a scan, I get it the day of or the next day. And we really re we rely on the states for large clinical trials that we just doesn't make sense to have open here. Once in a while, proton beam radiation is going to be more appropriate for kids, but that is heavily sold in the United States because it's a business. And you look on their websites and they say that you will, you will talk better and dance better and be smarter with protons, and it's just not true for the vast majority of tumors. It, this is something we need to have expert opinions on, but we have access to all of this if we need it. If it's better for kids, we'll get it. Um, but it's actually, it's quite rare, and especially when you have places, 
McMaster's fantastic, but sick kids is huge. And sometimes they'll have a clinical trial and I say, it's just an hour away. Let's get you on that clinical trial just down the street. Um, you come into a kid's hospital. As some of you know, I see some of the families that I work with here. It's, a, I think, a little bit friendlier than most adult hospitals on average. We tend to have a little bit more of a warmer focus. Most kids love the, uh, the train table and the playroom. And in fact, you can get chemo watching a, in watching a, playing a video game that's never quite as new as the kids want it to be, but it's, you know, um, the exam rooms are still exam rooms, so some kids like them, some kids hate them, uh, but we try to do a little bit of, you know, working in some child life play with a CT, play CT scanner for their dolls, and, you know, the dolls that have port a central lines and, and bald, bald dolls and things that are uh, a little bit more friendly for kids. So some kids come in here and they just, like, they just go to town. They know exactly where all their favorite toys are, and they just they just go nuts. Um, so, so it is. It creates a nice environment for many kids, especially after they get used to it. So, what's a brain tumor? It's it's kind of mysterious. We're not talking about metastatic tumors like in 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 the adult world. Most brain tumors actually, by numbers, would be breast, uh, breast uh, or colon or something metastatic to the brain. But here we're talking about primary tumors. One cell has a genetic error that slips through the cracks. Um, somebody said it this morning, or the, the previous session, very well. It's kind of a consequence of, the, of, the, um, of how complicated the whole system is. If you're making billions and billions of different DNA signals a day, something's going to be a mistake. And one of those mistakes will slip through the 17 different spell checkers that we have in our cells. And if that builds up, it's going to become a misbehaving, uh, out of control, dividing cell that will grow into a brain tumor eventually. And there's nothing that we know that causes that. It is a consequence, just like, I don't know why I make a typo when I type an email. It's just the fact that you're typing, the more emails you write, the more typos you'll make. Hopefully you correct them, and hopefully the mistake you make isn't the most important word in that entire email, but that's the concept behind the tumor formation. It divides, they divide and divide and divide, and they will not stop in brain tumors by definition. Um, they they will well, they'll stop whenever they want to. Let me put it that way, which is usually they won't. And types of brain tumors. So the, I don't like the word brain tumor because it doesn't mean anything. Because these are all the different tumors that I have had to treat, um, and so they really get categorized. You know, not to focus on these, but just to say these are all incredibly different experiences for the patient. So to say that your uncle's friend at work had a brain tumor in their 40s and they know what you're going through is totally false in kids. It really isn't even the same in adults. So to say that, yes, there are some similarities to the concepts we use to treat and diagnose and things, but the experience is, is dramatically different for different families. Most families want to know this, and that's reasonable. Is it benign or is it malignant? What are we talking about here? Cancer or not cancer? The trouble is inside of our brains, it's a tight, very valuable space. Every square inch of real estate could be important. And it's something we have to um, basically take apart and say, well, the most benign tumor in the worst location isn't going to be good either. So there's really location, location, location to me is critical in terms of conveying how serious this is. Um, the age of the child makes an enormous difference to what they can tolerate and what we can do to cure them or help them. The younger you are, the harder radiation is for your brain to tolerate, the more damaging it is going to be. The older you are, the more damaging chemotherapy is to your body, the more worn out your body is. And that starts even by teenage years. So I can give two-year-old patients chemotherapy that they are running around playing and eating, and, and a teenager would die of infections, and an adult wouldn't even survive the first dose. Their kidneys would shut down, their liver would be done for. So kids can, the younger kids can tolerate enormous amounts of chemo, but if you radiated their brain, they would never develop past that point of two in, in some circumstances. So. It really, the age of the child makes an enormous difference to what we do, where we can deliver radiation, where we have to think about not using it. Um, do we keep it focal to an area? Can, when, at what age is it safe to give radiation to the whole brain? Um, and then the tumor subtype, 
what not just what's on that list, but the actual molecular genetics behind that makes a tremendous difference to what we do. So again, getting to the benign or malignant, if you look at this patient, very similar to some patients I see, this tumor is sitting, this, these are the eyeballs, and there's a big tumor sitting right behind the eyeballs. If you took a piece of that, it is incredibly benign histology. It's an optic pathway glioma. It really doesn't have malignant features under the microscope at all. But if it's big enough to block or, or, or disrupt the function, then you're blind in that eye. And if it goes further back, your pituitary could be affected. And you could get into some very important structures back here with an incredibly benign tumor that no surgeon can remove without taking up the entire optic pathway. So if the kid's already blind, you could remove it safely because they are already blind but otherwise the patient has to live with this for life. So the benign versus malignant, a malignant tumor that's taken out over here, 100% of it resected, maybe followed up with radiation, maybe not, but that might be cured, and this patient will have to live with the consequences and potential dangers of this benign lesion. So it's very tricky to work your way through that language. Um, brain tumors are spontaneous and random events. When I was in training, and I still see this in my trainees, they, they feel very um, comforting to families. They come in, okay, you know what? You did nothing to cause this. You know, you, nothing you did. And, and it's true, and that's a very important message because parents, as parents, we are gonna blame ourselves for everything. It had to be something that I ate when I was pregnant. It had to be something in my job. It has to be something that I didn't do for my child. Of course, those are also incredibly scary and unnerving things to hear as a parent. There's nothing you could have ever done to change the risk of this happening, no matter what you did. Uh, and the healthiest kid in the world actually has exactly the same risk of the brain tumor as the least healthy child in the planet, and they're all something we can't do something about. So I've probably toned down my kind of comforting words in terms of there's nothing you can do, because I think that is part of the scariness of all of this. In less than 5% of my patients, they have a syndrome ahead of time. They live their lives with something like neurofibromatosis, type 1. Very common genetic syndrome. People can live a normal, full life, but you have a 10% chance of having a brain tumor. And that means 90% chance you don't, but it means that it's much higher than the average population. Is that what causes it? We don't really know, but we know that there's a link. And for less than 1% of my patients, they might have been four when they had radiation, and then there's a, uh, another tumor in the radiation field that we think might have something to do with it, and we call those secondary tumors. It can be a meningioma that's surgically resected, but we would say to the family, well, this, this might be due to the treatment that you had, which cured your child. But that's very, very rare that that ever happens. And we have absolutely no link to diet or vaccines or, or toxins, environmental stuff that we think of when we think of cancer. So it's tricky. We, we, want, we don't like this. We want cancer to be controllable. We want to know why it happens. Therefore, we want to know how to prevent it. If I don't smoke, I won't get lung cancer. Well, it's not true. You may get lung cancer regardless. Uh, Non-smoking non lung cancer is actually on the rise in some populations but it dramatically decreases your chances. And, you know, if I don't eat red meat, I'll never get colon cancer. It's not true. The vast majority of people, it's, irre it's irrelevant for, but we like control and there's, and there's very little control here. Any questions about that or thoughts? What the symptoms, so it, again, I don't need to focus too much on this, but the symptoms that people come in with, boy, it's, it's, um, it's hard to diagnose a brain tumor. If you're a, hard-working family doc, you could be out there for 30 years and maybe not see a kid with a brain tumor. So how are you supposed to deal with all the headaches you do see and all of the vomiting you do see? That's all normal. That's all part of life. Um, headaches with brain tumors, for the most part, are getting progressively worse. They tend to wake kids up from sleep. They might wake them up in the morning. Migraine headaches can be terrible, but they're supposed to get better when you go to sleep. You're supposed to be able to nap away your migraine or it, you know, we'll go get, get rid of it with Advil or something. Vomiting in the first thing in the morning is a scary sign to us. It implies the brain might be under pressure. So vomiting for your kids, if you have kids, young kids vomit all the time. They're always coming home with bugs. But 
if it's worse in the morning and then they're happy all day long and vomiting the next morning, something's weird about that. Hormone imbalance is, a, is one that's trickier. Um, patients that are coming in with more subtle signs. So a patient who's drinking and the parents are like, oh, they're just really well hydrated. But no, they're actually drinking six or seven liters of water a day and they're peeing seven or eight. And that's called diabetes insipidus. And that's, you're getting dehydrated despite drinking. That's a protein that you're missing in the, from the middle of your brain that can be, not always, but can be caused by a brain tumor. So something right here in the middle of the brain could be tiny and causing a major impact on your life. Uh, vision problems, so double vision's concerning, and it would be very concerning for us if everything was blurry or double. It's, the younger the child, the more they'll just accommodate, and just if, you know, covering one eye, now they can see well, they'll just walk around with their hand over their eye, and they don't tell anything, because they don't think it's that weird. They've fixed the problem, um, and so it can be hard to, to tell what kids are perceiving. If they're not in pain, they may not actually tell their parents about it. And um, walking can be a little bit more obvious, although sometimes balance issues can be passed off as a child who's learning to walk or is just a little bit clumsy. Um, th th that can be tricky. Seizures are very uncommon, especially for the more serious tumors that I treat. In adults, it tends to be much more common as a, as a red flag. Got to think about brain tumors with seizures. But in, in kids, um, it's just not as, as, there's so many other reasons that kids would have seizures, it doesn't tend to be on the, the top of the list. And occasionally we see hearing problems if a tumor is pressing on the actual nerve. So the location of the tumor can really define what the child is going through. Uh, again, thanks to Google, a kid with a patch over their eye, but my patients with tumors right in the center of the brain will have to wear a patch to block the double vision and allow them to functionally walk around. Location's really, really important. So what do families go through? Some of you in the room know what, what you go through. You go through worry, and, and, and sometimes you don't even know what you're worried about, but you're telling the story over and over again to yourself, to your doctor, to somebody at school. Why are they doing this? How come they're not able to, to do this? Um, you hope that eventually you get to a physical exam where somebody can pick something up and then a CT or an MRI scan, and that can be the next day or it could be booked months away with a lot more worry built into that. Then you meet the team. If it's something really urgent, you pretty much have to go straight to the neurosurgeon who may even take you to the operating room that week or that day. Uh, for non-urgent things, pa patients come to our neuro-oncology clinic and we get a bit of a chance to sit down in a more comprehensive fashion to slowly go through things and show the parents why we're concerned but why we're not going to jump on something that day. Surgery is often, not always, but often the next step in order to get the diagnosis. What does the tissue look like? And the treatment plan and, and then an observation period afterwards is going to be part of our, our, our overall plan for these kids. And if you take that first MRI where, where we, we have the concern, families are slammed with this news, they think, oh, is this going to be, you know, are we going to need surgery, are we going to need chemo? We don't necessarily know right away. There's very different treatment paths. So some pa many patients are just on one of these paths. And we see a lesion that's not pressing on anything important and is not related to the reason you had the MRI, then observation only is going to be better than any surgery that could potentially cause harm. But if it's in a dangerous location, then surgery, maybe surgery alone, um, again, in the types of tumors where surgeons can take all of it out, that might be the option. But surgery and then radiation for many tumors we treat allows the radiation to, to clean up any cells that are left behind, any cells that have infiltrated into the surrounding area. And then sometimes we need chemotherapy to, to cover that as well. Patients on a maintenance chemotherapy regimen, those are patients who um, are coming to see me every week where they just get chemo once a week and for long periods of time trying to control the growth of their tumor, not trying to get rid of it, but trying to make sure it doesn't grow and cause any more problems. Or some patients that are, uh, are young, especially because of the fact that we're trying to desperately avoid radiation, surgery 
and then intensive chemotherapy, sometimes even requiring stem cell support to get them through the chemotherapy, um, can be an alternate pathway. I don't get to choose these, and the parents don't get to choose these realistically, because um, they would take the observation only if they could, but it's kind of dictated by where's the tumor, how much did we get out, what was the likelihood of it coming back? And it all comes down to the kind of which of these three do you need, if any of them, surgery, radiation, or medications. So I, I can't imagine parents that have had to sit in the operating room, waiting room area, that must feel like the longest day of your lives, um, waiting to hear somebody from the team come out and say, you know, we got it all, or here's what happened. Um, often the patients have to stay in the intensive care for a night or a day or a week or, or something, and then several days in hospital with home with some rehab. And for the patients who have surgery only, this can be a very fast process. A week later, they're back at school. Some, several weeks later, they're still getting daily rehab to try to get them back up to full strength. And the surgeons are going in there to take the actual tumor out so that we can get a look under the microscope, hope, hoping to get to an outcome like this, where we take a tumor filling up part of the back of the brain and end up with a scan years later that looks like this, where there's, sure, there's still a hollow cavity, but the brain all around there is doing everything it needs to and functioning very well. We say that the scan is clear. I don't say normal, but I say it's clear. That means we don't see any tumor, and I don't think there's any there because it's looked the same for many, many years now. This is promising and positive. That's what the surgeons can get us to. Um, the actual tissue that they get under the microscope, the pathologists are trying to look at this and squint at it and, and be very definitive about what they see. I want them to be very precise, and if it means taking a week or even two weeks to find the answer, it's always better to wait for the right answer rather than the fast answer. Radiation, again, many families do not ever have to talk about radiation, but for some patients we do. The more aggressive or malignant or invasive a tumor could potentially be, um, we may end up talking about radiation, which is daily treatments aimed at the tumor for, for anywhere from four to six weeks, generally speaking. And um, it's focal to the tumor site unless we think we need to give a lower dose to the whole brain and spine to prevent the spread of cells that could go to other parts. And for kids going through radiation treatment, um, you know, there's a stuffed animal here and there's a DVD player. So trying to distract the child so that we don't have to give them sedation so that they can undergo treatment. It, it, it's completely painless when you're lying there, except for pretty annoying to have this plastic face mask locking your head in one place, and that's just so that the head doesn't move day to day. It's in the same general location. Well, this computer robot um, radiation delivering machine goes all around and has a very specific target um, that's outlined with incredibly advanced physics, and really the people I work with are at the Juravinsky Cancer Center and they do an incredible job of, of getting kids through this. They're not a pediatric hospital, but they do an amazing uh, job helping all the families through. I think it's a, a treat for them to work with kids when they get a chance. Some, again, some families never have to hear about chemotherapy, others do. Chemotherapy is just medication therapy. I used to think when I was a kid it was radioactive, but it's not, it's just chemicals. Um, there's, you know, four major categories that my patients go through. Some forms of chemo, they have to be admitted to hospital for a few days every month. And then the rest of the time they're at home and coming to clinic. Others have to come every single week to see me for IV chemo in the clinic and that's a maintenance regimen. Others, the parents are giving oral chemotherapy at home, pills or liquids, and that has its own challenges built in as well, for kids especially. Uh, and, then, and then some patients who require this more intensive chemotherapy approach, they are in hospital for sometimes weeks or even months on end. Um, this is less common and it's more likely to be the very young patients who go through this, again, trying to spare them from ever needing radiation therapy. But the chemotherapy, although it just looks like a bag of IV fluid, usually just a clear liquid, um, it can have effects because it's the treatment that's going everywhere. It can impact all different parts of the body. The radiation is never going to be given to the kidneys in a brain tumor. 
so it doesn't affect the kidneys. It's never going to be given to um, you know, the, the legs, but the chemo is going to every single part of your body, bones and muscles and, and, uh, and the heart and lungs. So it has potential effects, and a lot of what I do is monitoring and dealing with side effects and minimizing side effects over the years or, or weeks that they're being treated for. And the tough part about the job is, is which tumors are curable and which are not, and which tumors we think should be curable and end up not being. Some of the tumors that I treat are 95% curable or even 100% curable if, uh, if they respond really well to treatment or if they can be surgically resected. Those patients are going to be alive and well for decades to come, and we have to remember that in designing the treatments. Other patients have tumors where still in 2018 we are not able to cure those patients. We have tumors that we treat especially the, the high-grade tumors deep, deep within the brainstem, and, and no center in the, on the planet has ever successfully been able to come up with a reproducible treatment for those tumors. Um, so in the same group of patients, I can have pa tumors that are, you know, four out of ten patients will be alive in long term, others where ten out of ten patients will be alive long term. Um, and it's quite varied, and again, a part of that initial prognosis discussion is, what do I think might happen based on other patients, but I still have no idea for that, for that individual sitting in front of me. And of course, long term, you're going to ho you know, you can hope for this situation where maybe you don't have to do anything. So sometimes, again, getting back to the observation, you know, this patient is doing well, had a head injury from playing sports, uh, incidentally found this area, it was described as a tumor, but this kid was fine, so he's very, very stressful, um, but you kind of have a situation where you say, well, you might not be fine with intervention, chemo, radiation, treatment, that could make you very sick, let's just wait and watch, and we will be ready to do something the moment it gets worse. And that's a hard thing to do, that's a hard thing to live with, that's a hard thing to get your mind around, it is even for me. We're going to let you have a tumor sitting there, oof, but surgery is not, not a fun thing to go through if you don't have to. How do we follow kids in general? Well, we follow them for life. Um, if we've treated them, there are some older teenagers where we, we kind of give an opinion, but they, they really need a doctor to actively treat them, and we can't do that if you're over 18. But if you've had treatment and you're nine, then you can come and see us for life. And what happens there is a little bit of monitoring, a little bit of education, some perspective, um, I tell you, a 24-year-old is going to ask very different questions than a 12-year-old from what happened to me, what did I get treated with? And you, you do your best to kind of go over the summary for the 12-year-old. They're like, yeah, this is my mom's job. No thanks. And it's, if the 24-year-old is still saying that, you have to have a different conversation with them. <laughs> um, so, I mean, a lot of what we do that especially at the beginning, it seems like all we're doing is doing an MRI and a check. And just like, oh, your scan's all clear, everything's good, go home, everything's fine. But a lot of behind the scenes, and as, and as time goes on, we're, we get into neurocognitive testing, that kind of IQ test. How are you doing? If we were, need to help you in school, what do we need to help you with? Do you need more time on a test? Do you need memory aids? Do you, like, what, do you, what would work best for your school and, and eventually job support? And we're, we're hoping to get better at doing this to, to really support long-term for patients. Growth and endocrine function, again, the difference with kids and adults is that incredible amount of growth that potentially happens between zero and 18 in terms of their body changing and making sure that the hormonal balance and, and everything else is addressed. Um, eye exams to, to, to accommodate for, for problems they're having with their eyes or to monitor for side effects of treatment. Same thing with hearing tests and blood work can show us things that are happening even if they don't know it. Um, nobody would feel like their liver is having trouble, but blood work can show us that. Psycho psychologic support um, and mentorship can be really important. Where is, where is this going to fit into your life? Your life as a parent uh, of a child who's gone through this? Your life as a child who's growing up? Are you going to grow up and put it all behind you and never mention it again? Or are you going to be standing here at the conference and, and, and selling t-shirts and, and coaching people and saying, hey, you can do this and you're going to lead a support group or, or volunteer at camps that we have in Ontario. Incredible resources for for families, and trying to get these patients that come in with 
here's, you know, almost half of their brain is affected by a tumor and you think, how is this even possible? And, it, and the child has a, a significant uh, surgery, but their brain recovers because they're young and their brain is flexible and they're learning and they get back to here and they may be, you know, uh, maybe off to a, to a very normal, healthy life. The kid playing in the sand does not have to know that their MRI looks like this. They're just going to play if they can. They're going to do whatever their body lets them. So the long-term side effects, I think for most, most people that have been through this, uh, they kind of highlight the emotional psychological impact. The fact, you know, whether it starts with why me and what, was this, what does this mean in my life, moving to a neurocognitive, like, cloudy brain or memory problems or something that's not as good as I would want it to be as long as well as neurologic deficits. You know, I, I can't use my left arm as, as, it's not as strong as my right or, or my eye is always turned in or, or my hearing's not as good as it used to be. So kind of living with those long-term effects that we can adapt, but we have to understand them better. And then of course, some of the things that don't affect people uh, as much right up front, but long-term organ function, hormones and growth, the metabolic stuff that we see, uh, the rare potential for secondary tumors, and how do we monitor, but more importantly, how do we teach people about that? We don't want people living their lives terrified they're going to get a secondary tumor because it's only 1%, but I also don't want people going to their family doctor when they're 40 and saying, gosh, I've been having weird headaches, because their family doctors, if they don't know the story, they're going to say, Everybody gets weird headaches. Go home. And no, I need a CT scan because I had this when I was a kid. Oh, okay. Thank you for telling me that. Let's get you into the scanner. Social and academic impact is huge. Even the smartest kid has had to miss some school to, to have the treatment uh, or to be diagnosed or have surgery. Um, we need to know how to help the kids who are struggling and the kids who are, who can be as, as good as they want to be. Perfect. We'll wrap up here with just an idea of the research, you know, the research being done, and there's tons of research. I know there's a lot of language around, you know, the funding is lower for kids' cancer. Or, you know, I hear parents say we only get 3% of the money, but I can promise you that we make use of adult brain cancer research across the board. We are constantly um, developing technologies and drugs directly derived from what the adults are researching. So there's not as clear a line as people would think. And the vast majority of our medications have to come from the adult world. They're not developed for kids. No company's gonna develop a drug for, for 25 patients a year. They're gonna develop it for adult melanoma for 30,000 patients a year, and then we're gonna take a look and say, wow, that actually cures this type of tumor. Let's use it. And we're doing that constantly. Um, we also have some of the smartest basic scientists in the world working at pediatric cancer because it's one of the best areas to get funding for. It's also one of the coolest areas to work in. And, you know, I'm lucky enough to work with Dr. Sheila Singh, a neurosurgeon at McMaster, who is one of the country's leading minds in basic science tumor biology research. Um, it's amazing to, to see these people. Uh, we need to find who are the best risk and worst risk patients. If you have the same tumor, and I can tell you more than better this year than I could 10 years ago about the risk of that subtype, I'm going to be able to treat you better. I'm going to be able to come up with a better treatment. And maybe that means less radiation or more targeted chemotherapy. But as we go forward, we're going to have to think about what are the really long-term side effects. Um, a patient who's alive 50 years later, we're just starting to know what life is like for them. And of course, mental health and well-being. Where does that resilience come from for these patients? Um, we're not as good at, at you know, getting to the diagnosis. I'd like to be able to do that with a blood test. And one day before I retire, we'll take a blood test and we'll say, oh, this is what you've got. Uh, instead of surgery, we'll find some kind of DNA fragments and we'll say, this is the tumor. Um, I'd love to use less or, or no radiation for patients. I'd love to have drugs that can just melt these tumors away. And figuring out if they're new and they're expensive, how do we get them? How are we going to pay for them? And how are kids, kids, half of the kids that I deal with would rather have an IV than take a pill. They don't want to take pills at home. Adults were like, you know, keep me out of the hospital. But man, it could be a nightmare getting a liquid, disgusting medication twice a day into a child. Um, <laughs> you've all kinds of tricks. Um, 
knowing the really long-term impact. We don't, we don't know what a 90-year-old brain tumor survivor is for the most part because there aren't of, of some of the tumors because we haven't been curing them for 90 years. So we'll get there, but we don't know what's going to happen to some people radiated when they turn 70 or 80 for some of the pediatric tumors we have. And we need to know how to make people smarter. There's all kinds of apps for my cell phone that say, you know, memory, you can improve your memory by 30%. They don't scientifically work. They help you remember that thing, but they don't help you remember things in life. So, you know, we can picture the triangle over and over again, and now you remember the triangle. It doesn't mean I remember my phone number. Nobody knows their phone number these days, but. Um, and then, of course, in the, in the world picture, the, the, everything I'm talking about here is very fancy and very expensive. We need to come up with a way that this has to apply to kids all across the world, every developing and developed nation eventually. We need to figure that part out better. We'll finish off with what keeps me up at night. A lot of things, mostly my patients. Um, we do not know what causes brain tumors. We don't fundamentally know. We need to get to the bottom of that. That's what basic science is going to help us. Patterns are going to help us, but we don't know. We don't know the right amount of treatment for that one patient. We'll give you a dose of radiation that kids should be treated with, but we have no way of knowing exactly how much is too much. We don't know why some children relapse. We can get the best treatment for the best prognosis. We don't know why it comes back. And we don't know how to treat some tumors at all. Some tumors, again, some subtypes of the brainstem tumors, we just have no treatment and nobody has yet. We don't know how to navigate the truth. So, again, this is, uh, you know, this is something that excites us. Parents that I deal with are desperately hanging on for anything, a glimmer of hope. And there's nothing I would want more if I was a parent in that situation than to read about Mer Mexico's miracle cancer treatment. Um, and I see this all the time. There's a stem cell clinic in India, and all the kids are being cured. And, well, I don't see it, and I'm the only one in the entire region from Kitchener to Toronto who treats brain tumors. And I haven't seen that. Um, and then I go to conferences and I talk to all of my colleagues across the states and I say, so how many kids are being cured in that clinic? And all the doctors in Houston say to me, none of my patients. All the doctors in Texas and children's in uh, Dallas, none of my patients. And I say, well, where are these kids? They're having a great time in the news. Nobody's lying to us. But the patients that I've had that have gone to these treatments and have come back have died exactly when I said they would die if they stayed here. So maybe it's just a message of hope that people need maybe that's all it is but we just don't know where that fits in right now like we don't know where what should we be doing about this how do we support families how do we educate ourselves about it what does it all mean I, and i and i don't know the answer to that at all um i'd love to talk more about that so i think in the big picture cancer as people know brain tumors look at this weekend look at the group here look at the variety of people at this conference it brings people together and in an incredibly heartwarming way, an incredibly brave and innovative way, and it brings us, connects us as humans um, in unfortunate circumstances. It brings people together to support one another. And if you look at the Brain Tumor Foundation, the incredible work done through POGO, and then these amazing, like the kids' camps, the Children's Wish Foundation, the Tip of the Toes, all the people writing books and helping tell the stories over and over. This is the kind of world that adds a bit of a silver lining to an often gray cloud.